Good morning. Good morning. Good to have all of you with us in worship this morning. Glad you are here. Thanks for you all uh, at home joining us online as well, wherever you may be. Don't forget to uh, drop us a note in the comments and just say hi and uh, let us know that you are here. Uh, we are continuing our Lenten series on the book of Mark. So hopefully, again, as I've been encouraging you, uh, you've brought your Bible along. Uh, we're going to be hitting Mark uh, every time we gather. So we started uh, on uh, Ash Wednesday, which was, uh, was online, of course. Uh, but uh, so chapter one there. So Wednesdays, we'll have the odd numbered uh, chapters uh, until we, we're going to be. Anyway, today we're in chapter four. Long story short, let me just get to that. So chapter four today. Uh, again, the chapters are not long, so hopefully you've been keeping up so far. You're not too far behind to catch up, so please get into those. Uh, we do have the devotional books for this as well. Uh, Katie and I went through, we divided it up. We've got questions and, and some devotional thoughts for each one. Those, are, those continue to be available in the back, so I encourage you to pick that up too uh, as we continue to walk through this book together. Uh, again, good to see everybody. Let's rise, greet each other from afar, and start with our opening song.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I invite you to take a moment in silence then as, as together we reflect on our personal sins and our need for forgiveness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's rise as we confess our common faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated uh, for our announcements as Katie comes up. Good morning. A few new announcements for you this morning. First, you can see there at the top of your announcement sheet a thank you from the eighth graders. They started bagging up their kits on Thursday and have put together pretty close to 100 and they counted up what they still had left and set their sights on 100 more. So we're patching in some holes so that they can finish that up this week. Um, they've done a really great job with that. So thank you for your contributions to that project. Um, a new session of Grief Share is beginning this week on Thursday at 6.30. It'll be here uh, either in the fellowship hall or small meeting room. So if you or someone you know could benefit from participating in that, um, we'd be happy for you to join that, and Kathy Bartels can answer any other questions that you might have about that. Um, on Friday, the 5th, beginning at 11 o'clock, some of our members have organized an appreciation luncheon for first responders and utility workers for all that they did for us during our frozen week. Um, so if that is you or you know someone who, who works in one of those roles, um, know that they're invited to lunch here on Friday, starting at 11 here in the fellowship hall. Um, we did receive word that this Wednesday, the National Guard will be at the library giving out 100 vaccinations. We know that's been frustrating for some of you to figure out how to get that, so um, know that that's happening this week. There's a paper like this in the back um, it says that this is specifically for age 75 or older or health compromised. So feel free to grab one of these if um, you're interested in having that information. Um, we'll sing our offering song here in a minute. As a reminder, uh, you can continue to give online or drop offerings off to us 
in the office. Um, but we'll sing our offering song. Before we do that, I have one more thing to share with all of you. This is a letter from Lauren Niedewitz. Um She had something she wanted to share with the congregation before she shares with the community. So bear with me here. Dear Emmanuel family, this is one of those notes that I never thought I would have to write. Yet here I am finding myself at a loss for the words to explain the next step in our journey. In short, I felt the nudge to move closer to family and in so many ways, God has confirmed it. So this summer, the kids and I will be moving to Houston. It's a bittersweet move, but I know God will continue to be with us and guide our steps just as he always does. Chris and I had a good chuckle when we first found out we were coming to Giddings. We weren't sure we were cut out for the small town life. In five short years, you have made it incredibly hard to leave this place. We grew to love this town. We felt loved from day one. You showered us with grace, encouragement, and smiles. You were understanding when Mark jumped down from the altar area after every time we went up for communion. You got a sense of joy when my shy Lily waved or said hi to you. Chris felt appreciated and supported by so many of you. So thank you. Thank you for caring for our family so well. Emmanuel, you are loved. There was a reason my husband would spend hours out in the garage at nights working on wood projects while also writing his sermons or Bible studies. He loved his flock. He cared for you. I'm thankful I get to call you family. I am so thankful for the time we have had here. So many great memories and conversations were had within these walls, things I will always carry with me because they involved Chris and this congregation. I don't know what our future holds, but I know who holds it, and that brings me great peace. We love you. We thank you for loving us and sharing Jesus with our family. Lauren. So. We will continue to support Lauren and Mark and Lily and their family. Um, we'll continue to lift them up in prayers. We'll do that in our prayer time this morning, but just know that she wanted to share that they were moving with her church family first and foremost. So they'll be preparing for that this summer and we will of course be offering them as much support and prayer as we can. And we'll go ahead and sing our next song.
Let us pray. God of mercy and comfort, uh, today we lift up to you Lauren, Mark, Lily, uh, and all of Pastor Chris's family. Lord, as, as Lauren has shared the, the next step in their journey, we pray your continued strength, comfort, and peace for them. Uh, we know that uh, another transition will be hard and will be full of its own challenges, but we thank you for the strength, support, and love that uh, you, you have given them. And we pray, Lord, that uh, we have opportunity uh, to provide that direct care to them. Lord, we pray that you open our hearts and minds to, to see those opportunities and, and to help where we can. Uh, Lord, we entrust to you the, the place where they will land, where uh, they will be uh, surrounded by a new church family. And we pray, Lord, uh, that uh, as you prepare that place now to receive them, that you continue to bless uh, that family um, and, and those who will receive them and, and all that will continue to happen in their future as you continue to hold all of those things. Lord, we, we do give you um, thanks in many other areas. And Lord, as part of our gratitude project, we continue to, to thank you for many things. Uh, we thank you for those that have taken care of, of Gertrude throughout this ice storm. Uh, those who have taken care of so many others as well, though. But you know, for that situation, we thank you for the Wolfgrams, for uh, Officer Lehman and the Salvation Army. Lord, we thank you for first responders and for uh, utility workers and all who, who stepped up in those moments for every single individual story that uh, people were touched there and helped. We thank you, Lord, also for... Uh, Jesus walking with folks and the Spirit to help us as we study your word. And, and the, the final one that we're thankful for in this project that we shared this week is, oh Lord, that you preserved so many of us throughout the winter storms. And we lift up our songs of thankfulness and praise uh, to, to Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you continue to be with those folks uh, who continue to be in need uh, as the effects of the storm uh, linger and, and many people still struggling with it without either power, water, or, or some other... Um, uh, some other necessary thing, and Lord, we pray that you would supply that for them. Lord, for those who are sick or hospitalized, we pray your care with them. We pray especially for Gladys Karish and Mark Nowak. You know the needs of each, and we pray you continue to be with them. We rejoice at the birth of Easton Tyler Spitzenberger, uh, born to Sarah and Tyler. We pray your blessings upon all the family, Lord, as they rejoice in that, in that gift. Uh, we give thanks for many celebrating anniversaries with Gerhard and Linda Prusky, Robert and Louise Grimm, Edward and Laverne Pompel, and Jody and Janice Sean as they celebrate. And we catch you, Lord, to be with each of them. Uh, for birthdays, we give thanks with Cheyenne Berry, Crystal Smith and Amber Hill, Teresa Hobrach, Marilyn Schmidt, Cassie Prue, Annie Joyce, Evelyn Gersh, Mary Ann Frosch, Francis Etzel, Seth Matijic, and Esther Gaston as they each celebrate birthdays. Lord, continue to watch over and bless each of them. Lord, as I ring the bell, phase one, uh, the parking lot, uh, construction continues. We ask your safety upon all those involved. Uh, and, and Lord, we, we continue to, to pray for any others that we do have in our hearts and mind. As we, as we pray together now the prayer that your son Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please rise as you're able for this morning's gospel reading from Mark chapter 4. Already start today in verse 26. And he, Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown in the ground, is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up, it becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that birds of the air can make nests in its shade. 
With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him, uh, he, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were, were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Uh, but he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. <coughs> Excuse me. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated as we invite the children forward. Good morning. Y'all pick a seat and then I'll, I'll sit down. I'll sit right here today. Well, good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Today for our children's message, we're gonna use our gospel reading, of course, we're actually going to start at the end of it, and then we're going to work backwards, okay? So did anybody here in the reading that Pastor just read, where were Jesus and his disciples at the end of the reading? Jackson. Um, in, the boat. in the boat. Okay, they were in a boat, and what was happening to them in the boat? They were sinking, or they thought they were going to be sinking, right? They're in a storm. Have you ever been on a boat? when there's like rough waters, it can be a little freaky. Maybe can't catch your balance. The disciples are thinking, this is it. This is, this is how we go. And they're mad at Jesus because Jesus is having a nap. And, and Jesus wakes up and he handles the storm and he kind of gets on the disciples a little bit for, for not having faith in him. And, and after he handles the this, this storm, the disciples look at each other and they kind of say, who is this guy? Who is this guy that the, that the storm listens to what he says? Now that seems like kind of a silly question to us for the disciples to be asking, who is this guy? What do you mean, who is this guy? This is Jesus, right? And the disciples have an experience that no one else has had. They've followed him around. They've, they've lived with him, basically. As they've traveled around, they've seen the things that he does, and they've heard the things they t that he's taught, and still they say, who is this guy? Now sometimes, unfortunately, we're the same way. Right? We, we know about Jesus. We have the whole Bible. We can see his story from start to finish. We can see what God's trying to do in our lives. But sometimes we say, who is this guy? Not in a way that says we, we actually don't understand who this guy is, but kind of who's this guy to tell us what to do, right? When we sin, when we do stuff like that, it kind of pulls us away. We're kind of saying that to Jesus. Who are you? A big deal. But if we back up a little bit, we see Jesus t say two different times that the kingdom of God is like seeds growing. What do you know about seeds growing? Yeah. Okay, so a seed, then a shoot, then a flower. And does that happen overnight? No, right? It takes some time. Now, if you ask the people who are in charge of mowing the grass, they might tell you that a lot of growth happens overnight. But generally speaking, when we start with a seed, you're not going to wake up the next morning and see the plant with its fruit ready to go, right? It takes some time and there's a lot of care that goes into helping that seed to grow 
and to produce fruits. And Jesus says his kingdom is a lot like that. And what that tells me is that Jesus is very patient. Jesus can wait, right? And all the while, he's doing the work needed to help his kingdom grow. And so as you and I continue to grow up and we learn in our faith, and I know I'm technically a grown up, but I still have a lot of learning and growing to do myself, Jesus is patiently waiting. So when we have those days where we say, who is this guy? Or those days where our sin wins out, where we do things we're not supposed to do. We have the hope and the promise of Jesus that he is continuing to work on us, that he's continuing to help us grow so that we can, we can grow close with him. All right? Let's fold our hands and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for the patience you show us and the care you give us to help us grow. Please forgive us for the times when we don't want to grow in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks to you guys. You can head back to your seats.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As I, I mentioned at the beginning, we are in chapter 4 of Mark. I, I uh, want to encourage you, if you have your Bible, as I've been inviting you to bring them along, uh, go ahead and open up to chapter 4. Uh, if you uh, still have not quite caught up with us or haven't started yet, again, I, I'm going to share with you just how short these chapters are so you see that it's not too much to to be getting into, okay? So chapter four, uh, the top third of this page, the top third of this one, and a paragraph over here, okay? Um, you could read it multiple times while you're sitting here, but you're gonna, don't do that. You're gonna follow along with me, right? Okay, so, so chapter four, um, and uh, a couple of reminders uh, about what we're doing as we go through this, understanding that uh, Mark has, uh, just as every author does, Mark has a purpose uh, in, in what he's writing. Uh, so, so he's telling Jesus' story, uh, the, the life of Jesus, and he wants us to understand some, some very important things about Jesus. And we talked last time, for example, that uh, 41 times in the, in the Gospel of Mark, this, this book that we're going through, uh, Mark uses the word immediate or some form of it, right, to indicate to us some immediacy, some, some action type things of what Jesus is doing, right? It's not just the teachings, but that this activity does something and that there was, there was much action happening on, on two sides, on what Jesus was doing and the responses to Jesus. So, for example, last week, uh, we saw that the forces were beginning to unite against Jesus. Every time Jesus did something, people were grumbling. Uh, and in the very first story last week, as... Uh, as Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, and right, it says Jesus got angry with them because they couldn't answer the question about whether it was okay to do that. After he heals him, it says immediately they, the Herodians, so the, uh, the government leaders and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, immediately they gathered together uh, to figure out how to destroy Jesus, right? So there's action, much action happening on both sides. <clears throat> Well, today as we go, uh, and as we look at chapter 4, uh, you're going to start to see, see a new point, okay? And, and um, Mark records for us um, uh, right away that Jesus is telling parables. And I want to start with a discussion first. Uh, what, is, what is a parable? Okay, because we see this happen all the time. And I'm going to give you a simple definition that I hope helps understand why Jesus does these things. But so a parable as we see this, and Jesus is the one that does these, tells these stories. It's an earthly story, okay? So and today we hear the story of the sower. So an earthly situation, an earthly story with a heavenly purpose, a, a heavenly um, truth that he wants us to understand, okay? So, so today as we see this then, uh, we have this earthly story of the sower, okay? And a sower is the one who sows seeds, right? So you get a picture of just somebody out there scattering seed or uh, we know that people are deliberate in, right? I mean, how many of you have gardens that you're getting ready to, to go, right? Okay, so uh, I heard a, some people at first service, they said they were already, they had tilled the ground yesterday. Anybody do that this weekend already? See, a couple of you. So 
You're getting ready? Now, now maybe you're not going to cast seed out, but, but, well, we'll get to that here in a little bit, actually. Um, so the sower's casting seed out, and, and, and by the way, too, as we do this, we have to understand uh, if, if this is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, um, what do the parts correspond to? Okay, and as the story goes on, you'll see as these verses, and this first part here, uh, Jesus explains to them, okay, uh, what the parable means. So, so he tells the story, not everybody's going to get it, and that's going to be part of his point here. Um, verse 13, if you look there, and he said to them, to the disciples, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Okay, and then he goes on to explain it, and he says this, uh, just by way of example here. The sower sows the word. So in the earthly story that he tells about the sower, what was the sower sowing? Seeds. It might have been peppers. It might have been tomatoes, whatever, right? Thinking of your gardens. Sowing plant seeds. But here he indicates that the seed that is sown, the heavenly meeting is that the seed represents the what? The word. The word. Okay, so the sower sows the seed, and these are the ones along the path. <clears throat> and so then he takes apart each of the examples, because if you remember the parable, right, uh, some of the seed falls on rocky ground, some of it falls on uh, ground where the, there's going to be weeds, and some of it falls on good ground. There's a few different examples there. And Jesus reveals what each of those soils represent, and he says those represent different what? Different people. Okay, so, so for example, uh, these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, when they hear. So the different people are these different examples. Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. These are the ones sown in rocky ground. The ones when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root, and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So he says, those where the word is sown on rocky ground, right? And it says in the story that they, they sprout up and they die when there's some withering heat. He says, that's, there's people like that who hear this word respond, but as troubles or trials in their life happen, their faith disintegrates and it, and it dies. He goes on, now the others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things either in, uh, enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So there's those where the, the seed is sown, the word comes into people, and their faith grows, but all of a sudden the things of the world choke them out, and the faith dies there with them. But he gives the last example then of the good soil. But those where the sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100 Okay, so, so we start out here. Mark shares this story of Jesus telling a story about faith and how as, as that word goes out, uh, it is affected depending on the different environments that the people are in. Okay, so simple enough story. You've probably heard sermons about that and those kinds of things. But Mark, but Mark goes on. There's a lot more to tell. I'm going to see a bigger picture here. Finally then, as... as um, well, let me ask you this then, uh, just kind of drawing another c connection here. Uh, <clears throat> what's he talking about? Faith in what? So as Jesus talks about this faith, what kind of faith is, is and, and of course, keep in mind then, we know more of the story than the disciples do at this point. Because what has not happened yet in Jesus' life? He has not been crucified, right? Uh, he has not gone to the cross. He has not died for their sins. So, so we can't say that they have faith in Jesus dying on the cross because that's just so far out of their minds. But he's talking about faith and trusting who just in, in a general worldview, general practice to trust, just to trust God, right? And to see that in all that God does, uh, he, he is trustworthy, true, and those kinds of things. So he's talking about this trust in God. And, and when you do that, it's interesting, then he can, brings us to this next story. We have verses uh, 21 to, to 25. Uh, when we talk about um, having the gospel, having that good news of Jesus, more than they know at this point, we talk about, if, in the analogy of a dark world, we say the gospel is a what? Light. It's a light. 
Okay, so in this example, he says, what do you not do with a lamp? You don't hide it under a, a basket, right? Right, and there's that kid's song, uh, something about blowing it out and, uh, you know, all that stuff. I don't, I'm not going to perform it, <laughs> right? Uh, he says, you don't hide it. Okay, and so he's getting another example here. So he talks about faith. He says, there's some good news here. We're not going to hide it, but rather we're going to be sharing. And again, Jesus is re revealing more. Um, and, and he's talking about this gift, and he says, if what you have, you'll be rewarded more. Okay, so again, we have, this, have these illustrations happen along. Finally, he gets to this next one. Um, and these next, next ones come back together a little bit. He says, the kingdom of God, and by the way, that's a clue again to a parable happening. The kingdom of God is as if. Okay, so the kingdom of God is like, and if you ever want to, you might want to highlight those kinds of things. When you see that happening, Jesus is making a connection. He's going to tell that earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He's trying to communicate to us what it's going to be like, okay, or what God's kingdom is like, and he's, and he's drawing this connection. Um, so he takes us back kind of to the same idea from the first story. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. That sounds a lot like the first one, the sower, right? What happens to this guy? He sleeps, he rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. So let me ask you, so I know a lot of you, when we talked about the gardens earlier, uh, we were talking about, uh, you're getting your stuff planted, um, who's gonna do tomatoes, for example? Jalapenos? Cilantro? <laughs> I'm just asking for, maybe it sounds like a salsa garden, I'm just wondering. <laughs> well, I'll get you on my list. Right? Um, I don't mind trying your different recipes. I, you know, just if you want, if you want an impartial <laughs> response to it. Um, when you plant those things, now I know a lot of you don't do from seed. Does anybody do from seed? Does anybody do? Okay, so a couple of you start from seed, okay? Um, do all the seeds that get planted sprout? No, so you, you're always planting extra, right? So we understand that it's a general principle, and even we could probably say, even all the plants that we plant don't fruit, right? Um, he says here, in this example Jesus is giving, the kingdom of God is this, this man who scatters seed on the ground, just like that first part of the story that he told, the first parable. What does the person that plants the seed do? Just goes to sleep, he lives life. Night and day, he, rise, he, he sleeps, uh, wakes, and all that. And the seed on its own sprouts he knows not how right and we know sometimes it doesn't happen it says then the next verse the earth produces by itself first the blade and then, okay so it describes the lifestyle the the life cycle of the plant until the fruits and everything happens there is a mystery to what actually happens there now science has uh, studied this long enough and they probably understand it to a greater or lesser extent what are you able to do for the seed though in this story you plant it and you provide for it, right? What are, what are the provisions? What are the things you provide for your plants that you plant? Water, fertile soil, you might fertilize, right? You're gonna do a few things that you can do, but even if you do everything right, does it guarantee your plant's gonna produce the fruit that you want or everything gonna be okay? No, time and again, we've seen that happen. That's part of what is the analogy here. We don't understand how all that happens. It just does. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does, doesn't, despite what we do. And so Jesus is beginning to draw our connection here. We have this story. Uh, the sower sows seeds on the ground, and sometimes the, the plants take root, and sometimes they grow and do the right things. And even then, it's a mystery as to what's going to happen there. We don't know. We don't know. Okay? He knows. We don't. Okay? Um, and, and when the harvest is ripe, he says it comes along here. And then he gives to this more, another example here. He goes to the parable of the mustard seed. So, so he's gone from this example of all the plants being done to, these, to this few and how they actually grow. And now we get to the mustard seed. Uh, describes it as the tiniest seed of them all that grows up into this big tree with birds and the branches and this kinds of things. Okay. Um, and it says then, he, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them and as they were able to hear it, okay? Um, and he describes it, finally, it says, in private to his disciples. Jesus is laying out for them, and, and, well, and let me back up, something that we, I want you to see as we go through this, that as Jesus tells the stories, there is purpose, 
You know, just like I said, Mar Mark is, is doing things with purpose. As Jesus is teaching and telling the parables, they have a practical impact in our lives. So we've been studying Romans right now. It says the gospel is the power of salvation. So when somebody hears the gospel and they believe it, right? We said this in the hymn uh, that we just, or the song that we just sang, I believe, and, and, and then something happens to us. God is actually doing something. What actually happens to a person because of the belief in the gospel? As the gospel changes somebody's hearts and minds, and as they believe Jesus is Lord and Savior, what physically, uh, literally happens to the person? You may not be able to see it, but something is, is literally and really happening to them, or happens. They are saved. An eternal impact happens because of the gospel. So Romans tells us there's something real happening. And Jesus, as he tells these stories, is understanding that real things are happening to people. So these stories have an actual impact in people's lives. So he's been talking about faith. And he says, right, you have the sower scattering the word. And sometimes it takes root in different situations. It respond, people's, people respond differently. And tells the story of the sower. We're not sure how or why at least from our perspective or the hows or why. Um, it's something that we share, right? It's not something we hide under a lamp. He has all of these stories tie into faith and it's action in our lives. And then we get to not a parable. The last few verses, uh, verses 35 to the end here. And what has happened? Jesus has been teaching. Um, the crowds are there, right? And we see these crowds are big. Right, as Jesus has been healing people. Jesus hops in a boat with the disciples, big enough to, to carry this large group uh, of guys, and they're out. What happens while the boat is out on the water? Storm. Big old storm. I like how you ask the kids, how many of you have been in a boat? So I'm going to ask you, how many of you all have been in a boat? It's nice when, this, when the water's calm. How many of you have been on a boat when it's rough? How many of you liked it? Some of you weirdos, <laughs> right? Uh, it's not fun to be out there. I, when I've done it, Dramamine was my friend, right? I needed that. Ugh, got so awfully sick. Um, it is scary to be out on the boat when those things are happening, and, and the disciples are scared. And is Jesus scared? No. Oh, how do we know? What does the Bible say he was doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. <laughs> the disciples are, they're, they're, just blown away by this. Listen to what, the, what, did they, what they asked him. They woke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? We're dying. And you don't even care. Right? And Jesus has been teaching about faith, right? And what does he say to them? Right? Well, what's the first thing he does? It says he rebukes the wind and he says to the sea, peace, be still. And what happens? The wind ceases and the sea is calm. And the next question is, is from Jesus. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? They were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Doesn't get any better. They, they don't improve from that question. Jesus has been teaching about faith, about right, the seed that's scattered, and he describes these different situations. And we would like to imagine that the disciples, the guys who have been listening to Jesus every bit of the way, who, who Jesus, I mean, it said in the reading today, he explains everything to them perfectly, right? You'd expect them, like let's just describe the seeds that were sown in that first parable, which plant should they be? Are they on the rocky ground? Are they choked out by the things of the world? Or are they, would you expect them to be the plants in the good soil? You expect good soil. Jesus himself is teaching you. But this episode reveals what? I, I count them amongst the weeds, maybe, right? They have this faith that springs up, but that the troubles of the world, the weeds have sprung up, and, and they're terrified. And, and Jesus, we're dying. Don't you even care? Right? revealing the weakness that they have. And that's a surprise to us. And I think that's part of what Mark wants you to see. Right? That, and we're going to see that as this gospel, this book of Mark unfolds, even the disciples are not getting who Jesus is. 
We know the Pharisees don't understand. We know the Herodians don't understand. But even Jesus' closest followers are struggling with who Jesus is and what he's there about. And, and, and Jesus confronts them, right? Why are you so afraid? Don't you have, have you still no faith? There is something within them that is preventing this trust. Okay, and we're going to see that unfold as we go along. And to draw it into our own lives today, to have some application for us, um, we have the benefit to the disciples at this point of knowing Jesus' full story. Because where is Jesus' story going to take him? It takes him to the cross. And he is faithful in this, and he dies. Why? For you. He dies to take away your sin. And we know in that, we understand, and we confess those things, and, and we know, though, that the story doesn't end there. We know that Jesus rises, and we know that he ascends, and we know that Jesus is victorious, and we know that he has taken care of everything at that point, right? And as I talked about, we see that this all has practical implications in our lives, and I want you to see that in the world that we are in today, we react, we continue to act the same way as the disciples, this past, gosh, how many couple years now, we have been such an anxious people. Political issues, social issues, time and time again, uh, things challenge us. And as believers, we're screaming to Jesus, who is, I'm not going to say he's asleep, right? But to use the analogy here, he's calm in the front of the boat. We'll say he's asleep because that's what the parable says. And we wake him up, Jesus, don't you care that we're dying? Have you still no faith? Jesus has shown time and again that he has taken care of everything. The cross gives you the perfect evidence of that, that he has defeated all the forces of evil. He is completely victorious in this life. We talk about it every time we have a funeral. Maybe that's one of the reasons I like, it's going to sound funny, but I do like at the funerals we get to proclaim that truth, that, that what we see there, that, that, that the person who has passed, it's not the end of the story. We know Jesus is victorious, and we need to be reminded of that time and again, and maybe we need to be reminded of that every time we have these storms that happen, whether it's political, social, whatever the upheaval is, whatever the trouble is in this world, Jesus is victorious. And we need not fear. We need not worry. You should absolutely be filled with confidence and go out then with that light. Not hide it under fear. Because a basket's not a basket in the story, right? Your faith is hidden under a basket when you're worried about the things of this world, when you're not trusting Jesus, when you're, well, when it's that, that's just another sin that we have. But we trust in him. We hear Jesus' words and we pray that he continues to work in our hearts and minds to make us that good soil so that we may grow up with that, with that strong, uh, confident faith that will go into this world sharing this same good news. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And the peace of God that which surpasses all our sinning will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Shining.
world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will 